you know, in the past week or so, we've heard cases in Kumase, mm -hmm. right here in Accra, mm -hmm. of fathers who are supposed to be protecting their children, yep. actually abusing their kids. Mm. Yeah. Now, a couple of days ago, I interviewed a, a, a child yes. who, whose ear was cut off by his dad yeah. for allegedly stealing 250 cities, 10 years old. Mm. You know, and most of the time when you hear these stories, the family never gets justice. Wait, hold on. They used, he used what? A razor blade? Yeah. To cut off the Child's ear. ear and attempted to chop off all his fingers. Good Lord. For allegedly stealing his 250 mm, cities. Mm. Now, as barbaric as that sounds, it's 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 not it, it, it's not a, a, a case on its own. <laughs> it happens all over the country, and usually, the families will say, "Oh, let's handle it at home. Let's not go to court." Yeah. And some people will be telling the mother, "Oh, you know." who's going to take care of your kids yeah. if he's arrested? Who's going, to, who's going to feed you? Because mm. usually these same perpetrators are the breadwinners of yeah. the family. So yeah. I spoke to the boy about how he felt about getting justice mm. for what his dad did to him. And yeah. I was expecting him to say, he's I'm grateful. so happy because <laughs> what this man did to me is yeah. so traumatic. Yeah. I don't have to worry about him ever hurting me mm. again for at least two years. And he said something that shocked me. He was like, I, I don't want my dad to go away. He even thought it was two months. Hmm. I don't want my dad to go away for two months because who's going to feed me? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. My goodness. My goodness. Well, I think we should take a look at the, the interview you had, and yeah. then we'll come back and continue the conversation. Let's take a look. Zach, what do you have to do for two years now? What do you feel like? I feel good. I feel good. Two months in a dose. Okodomia, me no baba bwan. I'm scared and needy. At a time when the president is telling the nation to stay home, to be safe, some fathers have taken it upon themselves to brutalize their children. Last week, my colleague Hafiz Tijani brought a story from Kumase of a 26-year-old father who beat his son to a pulp for peeing on himself and stealing a yam phone at three years old. A few days ago in Wager, we heard a story of a 55-year-old man who cut off his son's ear and attempted to chop off the boy's fingers for allegedly stealing his 250 Ghana cities. What crime have these boys committed to be scarred for life? We are here at the Wager Division of Dofsu to speak to the victim's mother on exactly what happened. Or first can now show no, me a from me catch him so. Why you born in any papa wire day? Wash you no, in ten idiot, and yes, she. But the all ye idiot, me make up me all ye ya, me tis as you were chummy banana sonny dear. Me catch and send me a fine channel. So be not the better be dear, me pan dear, and yada me the better channel. If you say, Eddie, eh, ya pa. So by Uba, I'll keep any be beard, the babas as you sooner, and check, I call a kitty kitty affairs on so over bonny bra. No, I buy us to see any dear. Papa, I mean fine channel. The other I am, no. Why, we did me whoop and in your damn in the better channel. Me or worry, no, Nessa, and to come to Cassa. I did it to a binaural boomy. I did it to a binaural boomy, and to Cassa. They say, I'm a tear me what you are. If you say, what to me, no, you can't know the me tea up in Pim blog or Pim Pimmy dying. Timua and a real bobby bra, and a me tea mean to me cry. Aisha Adamu who was once married to Osman Mumuni, narrates her ordeal as his wife. I am a man who is 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 a man on May 17, 2020, the police received a report from the mother of the victim, Zach Osman, who was abused by her ex-husband, Osman Mumuni, with whom their son stayed with. According to the report, 
he chopped off part of the victim's right ear with blade and placed his fingers in an open fire after accusing him of stealing 250 Ghana cities at their home in Obuom Domiabra. Zak, who went through severe pains, was subsequently sent to the Amanfro Polyclinic where he was treated and discharged. Many teenagers in Ghana still experience frequent and multiple forms of physical, emotional, verbal abuse and violence. The 2013 UNICEF Child Protection Baseline Research Report indicates that when children were asked about their experiences of physical discipline, over 57% of respondents between the ages of 14 and 17 said they were beaten at home all the time. Assistant Superintendent Rosemary Votia, the coordinator of the Domestic Violence and Victim Support Unit at the Wager Divisional Police Station, has advised parents and guardians to desist from abusing children under the pretext of enforcing discipline. I will advise parents and guardians that they should exercise patience for the children. This man was saying that he, the guy, the boy, the little boy is stubborn and he acted out of provocation. No matter how your child provokes you, at least know that he or she is a child. Exercise a little patience for him or her. Counsel her. Educate her. Tell her what he should do, what he should not do. Because he's a child, he might not know the consequences of whatever he is doing. So if you are doing that and you think it's getting out of hand, let us know. We can involve um, social welfare. Social welfare can take them through some form of counseling and then to straighten up the child. That is all I have to say. But then if you go ahead and do it, the law will deal with you. Ten-year-old Zach has received justice from his father as the asv said it is a responsibility of the entire community to protect these so there you have it the story of a 10 year old zach who lives with his dad allegedly took 250 ghana cities he can't even prove that the child took it father takes the child chops off his ear uh, threatens to kill him if he screams and then attempts to chop off all his fingers. Mm. And before he's able to do that, the neighbor stepped in to rescue the little boy. Yeah. Two weeks ago, we hear a story of a father brutalizing his three-month-old over a yam phone and peeing on himself, which is something that three-month-olds are supposed yeah. to do. You know, is it a, 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 a case of mental issues? Are these fathers psychotic? Or is it an economic case where they feel like they are the breadwinners, they have to provide for the family so they mm. can do whatever it is they want to the woman and the children? And how are these kids going to judge us one day if we fail to protect them as a society? Yeah. yeah. Well, fortunately, we've been joined by Dr. Angela Dramina Abouadje, who is the lawyer and executive director of the ARC Foundation. And uh, she's been involved in a lot of work to do with uh, domestic abuse situations. Good morning, uh, Dr. Angie. How are you? Fine, thank you. It's good to have you here. Yeah, I'm happy to be back. <laughs> now, um, you, 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 you heard the story, you've seen the story. What jumps out at you first? Well, there are a number of um, connections. The first one, clearly, is that child abuse is endemic in our country, mm. and uh, it's time we took it seriously as a country. We've talked about this umpteen years, but we still haven't taken it seriously as a country. Secondly is the connection between abuse of the mothers mm. of these children, whether they are wives or, you know, um, people that they've lived with. Yeah. The connection between abuse of women and abuse of the children, mm. unfortunately by fathers. That is not to say that some fathers are not abused or mm. some men are not abused, but research across the world has connected very strongly the likelihood of children being abused when their mother is abused. Wow. And we can see the connections in both stories mm. that we've heard over the last week. Mm. And then also this thing about are they mentally ill? Mm. If they are mentally ill, nobody should take them to court. 
because they can't be held responsible for, for their, their actions. for their actions mm. so uh, when i hear that i get a little distressed mm. many abusers there's nothing wrong with them yeah. they exercise power over people they think are helpless mm. and can't do anything against them and they exercise they choose to exercise power like that yeah. it's a connection that needs to be made very very few people who do these kinds of things are mentally ill and mm. you know that because they don't stop at their child mm. they do it it's anyway everyone, uh, yes. okay. exactly there's okay. a pattern okay. that you can so i'm really hoping that um, on media discussions and so on people won't say oh they're you know mentally ill there no until it is established mm. Let's know that abusers show a certain pattern mm. of behavior. You can almost always profile them. Mm. And then by that, you're able to put in the kinds of interventions, preventive and protective interventions mm. in, in, in our society. Okay. Otherwise, we miss the point. So, Dr. Abaji, what exactly will cause a father? I get the, 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 the point about power. Yes, that is But this is, is it. your child. Yes. You're supposed to protect that child. Yeah. What causes a father to, to inflict such pain on his own child? Well, you see, you can look at it in several ways. But for me, most things that people will tell you why I did this, they're excuses. Hmm. So I was provoked. I was angry. I'm poor. I can't take care of them. I'm frustrated. You know, um, somebody, all of those things are excuses. Okay. The point is power. Power again by one person against somebody that they think is vulnerable. It could be your own child or it could be your spouse. And every time this kind of abuse is exercised, it's it you know it's it's a learned behavior and you choose to do it. And that's why in many places there are programs to help people to unlearn the behavior mm. and not to make them let them make excuses hmm. for their behavior. So let it not surprise you. I mean, if I put up my if I put on my pastor's hat, mm -hmm. I'll <laughs> say that yes, the world is sick. You know, everybody has that streak in them. They are only restrained by regulation or by if they have God, then they can be restrained because they know I, I shouldn't do this, mm -hmm. okay? Or by by societal norms and and and. Um, and uh, regulations and so on and so forth. So, well, there go I, but for the grace of God, yes, mm. you can say that. When you, especially when you come into, you know, a place of power, mm. if you don't restrain yourself by whatever means, the tendency to use the power to abuse somebody who is more vulnerable than you is, is very, very strong mm. in all of us. So, yeah. let's, so let's look at the issue of uh, safety nets mm -hmm. and um, systems that we have as a country. Yes. Child has been abused. Mm -hmm. Justice seems to have been served. Right. Is that the end of it? What's next? No. In fact, um, if you look at Ghana's laws and policies on handling violence, whether it's violence against women, sexual and gender-based violence, or child abuse, it's very comprehensive. Mm. If you take our laws and policies together, you have a real system of work that should be working, irrespective of whether we have money or not. Money is good, and money is important for these issues. But money isn't all that there is to it. Mm. Unfortunately, Ghana is notorious for not enforcing laws. Hmm. We can't run away from that. And the more the laws are about the little people, mm. the more we think, oh, this is a social thing, you know, it will go away after a while. Say, you know, that's how we were okay. raised. You know what your okay. daddy did to me. Please go back. Those kinds of things. Mm. Okay, so there's a tendency to look at those laws and policies as not as important as our economic and macroeconomic stuff and all of that. And that's really hurting us because, mm. guess what? The people who are falling through the cracks are the human resource of this country. Yeah. So in our laws, if you take the Children's Act, you read it together with the Domestic Violence Act, and you take all the standard operative procedures, the SOPs we have, mm. and you take policies on children, and we have about... Ten beautiful documents, maybe mm. I can count, mm. of all kinds. Yeah. And you take all these together plus our criminal code, our Criminal Offences Act and so on, you have a system of work. In that system, you, f you have the justice system, which is only a little part. I am not a fan of the justice system, even though I'm a lawyer, oh, yeah. and okay. I know that we need to really work at it well. Mm. But 
when I say I'm not a fan of it, it's not because it's not needed. It is because it must be complemented okay. by a social system, okay. a social services system that mm. enables victims to not just get the legal justice, mm. but the restorative justice. Okay. You know, the kind of thing that enables them to become yeah. whole again. Okay. And that's why the Department of Social Welfare has a role. In fact, the child says, who is going to take care of me? Yes. Mm. In our Children's Act, is a section 14, it is the district, hmm. the MMDAs have been given direct responsibility for protection of children in their district. And I don't think there's wow. any, any, any leader there that knows this. You know, they have an idea, you know, they talk about it sometimes, hmm. conference, here, yes, seminar, there. What would it take for us to hold them accountable? Well, you see, some of what we are doing. Okay, it's time for, one of, it's time for society to know what our laws say and to be able to talk about these things and hold people accountable. accountable. Mm. Let them know. It's the district. It, they're supposed to utilize all these little systems in there. They, yeah, granted, they may not have all the money that they need, like the Department of Social Welfare, DOFSU. Did you see that by one leader's instrument at DOFSU, we this case yes, immediately exactly. in less than one week. So it also talks about capacity. Mm. You know, an understanding of your role You've been trained for it, and you know you can kick into place all these systems and get justice. Mm -hmm. But when you're done, even the DOFSU officer knows that their case is not done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They must link up with the Department of Social Welfare. They must link up with the counseling or psychological services for the child. They must link up with somebody who is able to maybe connect this mother to leap. Hmm. Okay, and the Department of Social Welfare can do that so that they can find a way of taking care of this boy. Yeah. But ultimately, even yeah. if they are not able to do that immediately, it's the village that raises the child. Hmm. We must be able to organize around these, but somebody must take the lead. Hmm. And the lead is the district through its, its uh, Assembly Social Services Committee and the other institutions that are in and around these people to enable them to do what is necessary. So we'll talk about where to even start from as yeah. far as helping the victim get back mm -hmm. on, on, on his feet and the mother as well. But let's talk about money in all of this, you know, yeah. economic dependence on the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. I spoke to the mother, she talked about meeting the man when she was 17 years old. Mm. He promised her a sewing machine mm. when they married. After she married him, he never gave her the sewing machine. Mm -hmm. So she was financially dependent on the man. How does that feed into this power that the perpetrator feels that he can do whatever it is he wants to them? They will never complain because their very existence depend on him. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. If you don't have economic dependence, it means that you are dependent on your spouse. And it also adds to their notion that they have more power over you. Um, the only thing is how do we pick people up from there? I think in the past, there used to be a lot more advocacy and work around women's economic empowerment yeah. issues, for example. I think that marriage didn't work. It didn't. Right? She's, Even his she's, other wife, too. He used ah, to beat you her. see? Yes. She's gone she off. Left. And she may be poor, but she's fending for herself one way or the other. It mm. means that the situation is not totally hopeless. Mm. It is about being able to provide the kind of information that helps people to be connected to possible resources, mm. some of which are in the system. Okay. Okay, so I think that, you know, my heart bleeds when I know that there's work to be done and some people are sleeping on their job. Yeah. That's what's, you know, <laughs> because we have enough institutions, systems, structures, laws, mm. Mm. policies to mm. be able to do something. Yeah. We can't do everything, but to be able to do some things about these things. So, so when people are sleeping on the job, people don't get the information they need to be able to access whatever little resource that they can get. And women are known to turn over where I work. We've given people as little as 50 CDs, 100 CDs. 200 cities. If I tell you the stories, we won't finish. Mm. Or what women have been able to do with money like that. Mm -hmm. So really, there's no excuse. Please when the use government this says pump money into SMEs, mm -hmm. you know, be also specific about what women are doing, doing. Those, within those sectors. You'll be yeah. surprised what yeah. they can do with little uh, money. Uh, uh, give us a sense of um, 
what the Ark Foundation exactly. does, because I know that you have a sh you have the shelters and yeah. so on. One it, shelter. One <laughs> shelter. Okay. But, but thank you for the work. You've been working yeah. for almost thirty oh. years in this space. So Twenty something, something years. Yes, yes. Yes. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. So, Actually, so how 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 does your foundation yeah. help in these kinds of situations? Well, okay. So um, right from the beginning, we started with a lot more talking, advocacy, and so on. But we also realized that people get abused and they need services. Yeah. So I, I, I then decided I don't just want to talk. Yeah. You know, put your money where your mouth is mm -hmm. or your, 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 your strength where your mouth is, whatever. So we set up um, services. And the services looks, looks at helping people in an integrated kind of way. Mm -hmm. So if you came to us, we would do counseling with you and we, we are trained to do that. And then we will do professional assessment with you and then we have a directory of services who else can help so for mm. example if somebody walked into our organization and uh, just had a little clot on around them running yeah. from an uh, abuse abuser mm. okay we'll try to look at their first aid needs okay. immediately okay. and then link them up to the police if they want to report if mm. it's a child we have to okay. that is a child okay. but if it's an adult it's a their agency they have to do that we link up with the police we have to follow up if you don't follow up mm. your case will fall through the cracks mm. Unless it's a very trained police. And look, the trained police that I know, they have been trained to a certain point. So I am confident in that. But for those who are not trained in these issues, yeah. this is like a bother to them, you know, okay. most of the time. Okay. Yes, so you follow up with those cases. Then you assess them. Is there somebody who is in danger, who needs shelter? Then we take them to the shelter where they receive a whole range of services in the shelter, mm. all the way to resettlement and reintegration back into the society. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this we, we do it in an integrated kind of holistic fashion, depending on the nature of the case. Mm. But we are just a small organization. Yeah. We don't cover Ghana. You yeah. know, we we need more of these services yeah, across the regions, across the districts, mm. so that they can. We, we have some messages help. from our viewers, and um, keep the messages coming through. Uh, Kobna K. Benson says, this is partly an unfortunate consequence of stay-at-home measures and school shutdowns due to the coronavirus. Oh. We need to try and strike a healthy balance between COVID-19 measures and protecting our children in these times. What's your first stab at this? My first thing You've been doing this for a long time, way, before, way before COVID-19. Yeah. Sorry, I'm I don't sorry. know why I'm, I'm sneezing, it's okay. but it's good I have my Your face mask. mask. Yes, see. that's good. So um, the first thing is I don't want people to use COVID-19 as, as an, an excuse. excuse. Mm. How important is it for us to not make excuses for the perpetrator? If as a you make excuses, you won't do anything about it. COVID-19, yes. It means that because you're in the same space with somebody who has already been abusing you, now they have more of an opportunity, more time on their hands, and more excuses mm. to do that. Mm. Okay, so yes, we must be looking at COVID-19 specifically around issues of abuse, family interaction, family cohesion. And, and that was one of the things that I missed in the policy statements right from the beginning. That, you know, lockdown, we are going home and everything. But what are the protective measures that we are putting in place yeah. for vulnerable people within our households? I did not hear some of that. Mm. Food, yes, we'll give you food and all of that. But what about the other things? Mm. So, 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 that so, was... so, Doc, let's talk about our call to action now. Yes. We're telling children to stay home. How do we begin to put aside funding? Mm -hmm. you know some funds to support you know organizations like yours who are focused on the psychological social well-being of the child because what what was the essence of surviving covid-19 if you're going to live with the trauma of being abused and the society that's supposed to protect you doing absolutely nothing about it well i'll think that first of all um Ghanaians uh, do not have a big philanthropic culture but they give it's a contradiction in terms, you know, <laughs> but it's yeah, for another program. You know, there are corporate organizations, companies, and so on, who make money, some who don't make a lot, but some who make money. There are a few organizations such as ours that do this kind of work. We need to scan these organizations, and really, they are all suffering. We need to begin to put some money into these organizations. If you're worried about accountability, check who they are, check their former records, check their working relationships, and try to put some money 
into these organizations. I must say that currently we are supported by individuals in this country, hmm. a few outside of this country, and um, a few corporate organizations. Um, few, but individuals. We are not having any multinational donor funding, that kind of thing. Before Ghana Beyond Aid, we had started, <laughs> you know. So we are, we are depending on people who believe in our cause to really support us to do work for our own children and our own citizens the best way that we can. And I'm thinking that the, these organizations, the World of the uh, FIDA mm. is there, you mm. know, and we are few and far between. Yeah. And we need to support them. Department of Social Welfare is itself, I'm sorry, this is no disrespect to them. I love them because they are good people who work there, but they are mostly frustrated by yeah, lack of resources. Mm. It's almost like a, 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 an orphan and vulnerable child by yeah, itself. Yeah. It's time that some citizens supported some of the district departments of social welfare to be able to go around and do their work of, of monitoring and educating and, and providing services for people like this little boy. Okay, They need money to move, yeah. to take that... Uh, taxi, whatever, they need, they need something. And it doesn't appear that the government budgetary allocation to the Department of Social Welfare is going to change any time mm. soon under the Ministry of Gender. It's, it gets so, so little money. Yeah. So, so if our viewers yeah. are touched, and they, um, you've been working with hundreds of families like Zach's, and they want to support the work you do, how do they contact you? Because I think it's, it's better for us to channel our funds through organizations like yours than to try and reinvent the wheel. Right, so we have a hotline which is also a Momo line. Okay, okay. okay. so it serves two purposes: zero two four three seven 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 three. So there are five sevens in in okay. the middle. That's the fastest way to get us: zero two four three seven 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 three. It's a hotline for reporting abuse. Yes. It is also something by which you can support us. And you would certainly uh, get a big thank you from us. Thank you, thank you so much. much for the work that you do. Thank you for thank the you. work that you do too. <laughs> well, thank you for watching this segment of the show. I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Angela Dramina Abuaje for the fantastic contribution on this show and the work that she's been doing. My name is David Kwekwesechi. And I am Jifa Ikea Ametam.